So let me just start out with unconscious bias or implicit bias. Um, in the work that we've done, one of the things that we find regularly is that students describe to us that they're worried about what people think about them. That they have educators who have said things to them or other students have said things to them, that they have communicated to them uh, messages that really have denigrated them, made them feel like they don't belong in the academic environment. And from my perspective, most educators, not all, but most educators are well-meaning and well-intentioned people who are here because they love to teach, they love students, and they want to do the right thing. Now, of course, there's Jerry, but beyond Jerry, most educators don't fit into that demographic. I hope no one here is named Jerry. <laughs> um, if you are, I'm sorry, and I know you're great. Um, so anyways, <laughs> so we all have biases, right? We all have things and ways that we think about people that view them from stereotypical vantage points. And it's part of our socialization in the society where we are taught to view certain people in certain ways. So as a result, there's been a lot of work that's been done on implicit bias or unconscious bias, the, the, the bias that isn't necessarily readily apparent, the things that we may not even know that we believe about other people or that we ascribe to. So here are two different definitions and one different description of unconscious bias or implicit bias. And you'll see, I'll read the first one, it says implicit bias is the attitudes or stereotypes that affect our understanding, actions, and decisions in an implicit manner. Activated involuntarily, that's key, involuntarily, without awareness or intentional control, and they can be either positive or neg negative, everyone is susceptible. Did it say somebody or some people? No, it says everyone. So I just highlighted a couple key um, words that kind of stand out to help paint a picture about what we mean when we're saying implicit or unconscious bias. There are attitudes that we have that are typically activated involuntarily. So we're not necessarily aware that we hold these things about other people. And they motivate our actions, they motivate the qualities that we ascribe to other, to other people, and inevitably they do influence student success. So typically the progression of how we, we think about it is that we hold biases that we may not be aware of, some of them we may be, and then the manifestation of those biases are often seen through microaggressions, where we say things to people or we do things unconsciously and we don't even recognize that we've done it. And so uh, for our work, we think that's ex extremely important. Now, the work on implicit bias talks about two different types of thinking. And there's a book here at the bottom. If anybody has time, it's a great book to read. Um, it's called Thinking Fast and Slow. And they talk about this, this, the difference between being a system one thinker and a system two thinker. And in reality, we're all both, and we kind of transition back and forth depending upon the context, and I'll explain what that context looks like. But in terms of system one and system two thinking, oftentimes what we want to do is employ system two thinking. We're, we're being conscious about the words that come out of our mouths and how we engage and interact with other people. Doing so requires us to have more control and it, requir it requires a greater amount of effort. And when, what we find is that when a person is engaging that system too, that they are less likely to convey bias and engage in, in microaggressions towards other people because they're being conscious about what they're doing and how they're being perceived by other people and in their interactions. That's the ultimate thing that we would like to shoot for. In reality, most of us are, are oftentimes operating on a system one level where we are essentially engaging our unconscious mind, we're responding. It's automatic, it's lower effort in doing so. And if we think about it, there are certain characteristics of situations that are more likely to produce a system one versus system two thinking. Now, that's important because again, our biases are most likely to be communicated and reflected when we're engaged in system one, right? When we're just responding, when we're acting, it's we're, or we're pulling from that unconscious mind, we're engaging in efforts that are, that are automatic and low effort. 
And here are the characteristics of it. Here are the characteristics that produce or most likely to produce that system one type of mindset. Situations where information is incomplete or ambiguous. Circumstances in which our time is constrained or times when our cognitive control is compromised where we're experiencing, for example, stress or insufficient sleep. Now, I don't know about you all, but that describes my life. And I think it describes the life of most educators and really most people who work in any type of social institution. So as a result, we know that in general, we're pretty likely to see a system one kind of mindset and thinking be manifested and as a result we can't be surprised that microaggressions then that come out of this are a pervasive and normal part of our daily lives. And I'll come back to the part of normal here in a moment. But again, where we have incomplete information. So for example, let's say that like that example, remember I was talking about a student A student who, or you know, I'm, this is my class, students are coming up, and I have a student who comes out of my periphery view, right? It's an example where I'm just responding, not even thinking about what I'm doing. I'm reverting back to how I've been trained to think about that person. So what we know is this, when we're, when we're engaged in these types of situations that promote our system one thinking, that we're referring back to prior information that's in our minds that's that's told us to act and respond in certain ways. And it goes back to a concept that we call the primacy effect. So the primacy effect refers to the fact that t individuals tend to give weight to information presented earlier when forming opinions and making decisions. So we can think about this in a lot of different perspectives. One is an argumentation perspective. So um, oftentimes, in, you know, when, if, if Frank were here, my, my colleague, his background is speech communication, one of the things that he would tell you is that the first person to make an argument has the strongest argument because everything that comes after that is typically a counter argument to that main argument, right? That's important. So I've seen it sometimes where you'll be watching like the nightly news and you have like a panel of people and they're getting ready to, to debate something and then the, the host turns to the first person and they say something and then now everyone is like, you know, they might have had all their notes prepared about what they're going to say, but because that person said something that was kind of over and left field, now everybody is responding to that one statement because their argument basically created a foundation for which all other arguments were basically going to be formed or responded to, at least for, you know, the brief period of, of those segments. We can see it also from a socialization perspective where the earliest experiences that we have, those most formative experiences that, that go into our minds, are the ones that we tend to pull from. So if my early experience uh, taught me that certain groups uh, were, were bad and I should avoid them, then that's how I'm going to then respond to those groups when I engage them, unless I've gone through a lot of other experiences that has shown me otherwise. So, I want you to think about this for a moment. Think about, well, let's use black males as an example because oftentimes when we're talking about unconscious bias, it tends to be the group that is used as an example because they, we tend to provoke certain types of, of sense making. So think about your first and most formative experiences, initial experiences with black males. What are some things that come to mind? What are some images that flash into your mind, like the earliest experiences that you can remember that really submit in your mind as being formative? Let me tell you what people you will usually say. They'll start talking about TV shows. Well, my first experience with black males really wasn't engaging them directly. I didn't know any. They didn't really live in my neighborhood. Um, I, wa I watched Samford and Sons and Different Strokes or I watched any other show that you can think of, right? These shows that helped to paint my image about what it meant to be black men. Or I grew up watching sports. I grew up watching 
OJ Simpson. I grew up watching Wilt Chamberlain. I grew up watching these individuals, and I, I think about black men for their, for their athletic prowess, right? Or I remember these images on the television of, of this nightly news flash. A suspect is wanted for doing this certain thing, and it's a black male, and, and then the next night, it's a, another black male, and he's done things, and they're thinking to themselves, man, is it only black males who commit crimes? Not really, it's just the ones that would show up on TV. Or maybe I had an experience, I have uh, my grandmother told me, don't go into that neighborhood, that neighborhood is a bad neighborhood. So oftentimes what you find is that there's positive experiences that people have had and negative experiences, but more often than not, the positive experiences uh, create images of, of black men, for example, that situate them as either ath having athletic prowess or being comedic. Not necessarily being people who are viewed as being brilliant academics. Now, we could argue about whether well, the fact that we should separate the identity of a scholar and athlete and all that, but we can be real that oftentimes that's not the way that, that they're presented. We're presented. So that's something that, that has to come to my mind. The other thing is that, that usually it's presented in a way where there's some sort of fear or criminalization that has come into mind. So if I'm an individual and I'm, I've grown up and raised in this society, I've been taught to view these individuals in certain ways. And as a result, the primacy effect when I'm engaging in those quick interactions with people, those are the memories that I'm pulling from unconsciously. I'm not even thinking about it. And what we find is that those, the categories that we, that when I, uh, usually I do that as an exercise and people start calling out the different things in terms of how they think about black males, in terms of those early, those early images that they have, good ones and bad ones, and by the way, research shows that bad ones tend to stick in your mind more than good ones. Um, in fact, there's a great paper in psychology called Bad is Stronger Than Good. <laughs> that would be a good one to read if you ever want to get a, get a read on this. But basically what happens then is that those are what become cemented in our mind. So there's been research that's looked at how how th these things can be manifested because maybe it's not something that's super overt where we haven't you know, been raised to see you know, images of, of, of black men in these negative ways. Maybe it's the more subtle things. So there's been research that's been done. Here's a study that took place in early childhood education where basically what they did was they gave kids video clips and they basically were supposed to identify kids that they liked, that they wanted to basically have engagement with. And they gave video clips of different kids and what they did was they had the educators in those clips treat the kids in certain ways. So the educator who walked up to a child and gave them a big hug, right, versus they saw a, 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 chill, a, a child and they stepped back or they, you know, they frowned, they shook their head. And what they found is that children learn not just by what was said, but by nonverbal behavior. Not surprising for anybody who's had children or grandchildren or stepchildren or cousins or nephews or anything else, you probably recognize that, you know, that's why we say things like, do what I say, not what I do, because what I do is very powerful. So this is what they found in this study. Young children can catch bias from an infected atmosphere. That is by observing nonverbal bias exhibited by other people around them. What is more, preschool children generalize this bias to other individuals. Thus, exposure to nonverbal bias could be a mechanism for the spread of social bias throughout the world in hearts and minds of children and adults. And so if we think about these images, where they come from, the media, nonverbal behaviors, things that our family members and friends had said to us, I don't know about you all, but I think most family has at least one crazy uncle. I have two, right? <laughs> and I got one who's really kind of racist. I, mean, I love him to death, but he's racist. And he says things, I'm just like, oh my gosh, like you can't take you anywhere. You can't take him out in public, right? And but those are things that are formative experiences that stick with you that you don't even realize sometimes that you're pulling from. I'll, I might date myself here, but let me tell you about one experience that really stands out with me, not about my uncle, but just about an experience that I had that I think is a real formative experience for me is um, 
I mentioned O.J. Simpson. Typically, when he comes up in um, this example, he comes up for two different reasons. One for athletics and the other for the trial of the century. Um, and I remember when I was a child, again, I'm dating myself here, um, the trial of the century was taking place when I was in uh, middle school. And they, and I was, I'm from a small town, uh, about 1,600 people in the middle of nowhere. Uh, the school that I went to had 100 kids in it. And me and my brother and Percy were the only African Americans in the school, so pretty homogenous. And I remember that the, the teachers thought that this is an important moment. This is history taking place. And so what they wanted us to do is be present for the reading of the verdict of the O.J. Simpson trial. So they brought all of us into the school library. Why? Because it was the only place that had a TV. And we sat down at all, all, all the students, all the teachers, principal, everyone, to see the verdict being read. I think they thought the verdict was gonna go a different direction. <laughs> so I remember sitting there and as they read not guilty, not guilty, not guilty, but the thing, like the, the emotions on people's faces, the things that people said that were very much like racist in nature, and the, the ways that they began talking about black men, and, it's, and it stands in my mind as a very formative experience that I had that was something that, that has always stuck with me. Well, those things, when we, they stick with us, they influence how we engage other people. So now, when we have these biases, right, there's three different ways in which they can manifest. One, we can have no outward behavior, which is extremely rare. Or we can have verbal behavior, such as that stepping back, avoiding eye contact, crossing our arms, clutching purses or wallets. Or we can have verbal responses, such as microaggressions. We see this play out in all kinds of different areas of our lives. We see it play out in law enforcement. For example, um, there was a study conducted by Sadler and colleagues. And what they did was they had police officers and they gave them images of suspects. And basically, the suspects were black and white, and then they randomized whether they were armed or unarmed. And it was a very simple study. The idea was if they are armed, you are to shoot them. If they are not armed, you are to what? Not shoot them, right? So shoot them if they're armed, don't shoot them if they're unarmed. And what they also measured the time that it took them to basically make that decision, right? So what they found in the study is that, well, actually, what do you think they found, for those who haven't heard this? Were they more likely to shoot black suspects when they were armed or when they were unarmed? Both. <laughs> right? And the, the time differential was something that also differed, right? Shorter to make, quicker to make the decision, longer to not make that decision, right? So it's an example of how Police officers who are oftentimes good, caring people who want to do the right thing can sometimes do the same things that we do in education unconsciously, except for them, the, when they make a mistake, it's oftentimes it can be a situation that involves force and can be fatal. But let's go back to that. In law enforcement, are these conditions present? Is, is incomplete information? Time constrained, stress, insufficient sleep? Absolutely, so we can't be surprised that we see some of those things taking place, which is why it's important for us to have these conversations, not just in education, but in all disciplines. In healthcare, we see the same thing as well. They had people, there's a, a test called the, the um, implicit association test. Has anyone here taken it before? Okay, one person, that is everyone's assignment. Write down project implicit on a card, and just go to it, it's on the internet, it's a test, it's done by Harvard University and a bunch of other universities, and it's free. <laughs> I, I wanted to emphasize that. <laughs> it's free, and you go online and there's a whole different battery of different tests, and you can take these tests to see how you score as it relates to your unconscious bias or implicit bias. And some of you will be very happy with the results, Many of you will not, and some of you who you, some of you who think you will be score score well in terms of your bias will find out. Well, gosh, maybe I'm glad I'm not a police officer. Seriously, 
I, I mean, that's, that's what people end up finding. There's different ones where, there's different types of ones where you're looking for suspects. Uh, there, and it looks at different types of bias. So it's not only racial, it, there's also gender bias um, and all, all, different, all, all kinds of different types of bias. So what they did is they, they've given this test to, to physicians and, and then basically had people score in different areas. And what they found is that uh, pediatricians with higher level of that bias were more likely to prescribe painkillers for white patients as opposed to black patients. Why? Because maybe I have a criminalized view of, of black people, or I think that they might be more likely to abuse those painkillers. Black patients treated by primary care physicians who had that higher scores on, the, on that test reported lower confidence in their doctors and that they felt less respected by them. We see this in hiring decisions. Every year, there's like a new study that comes out that shows bias in hiring. And this typically is something very similar. We're gonna have the same resume or, or CV. We're only, go, uh, we're only going to change the name of the person to have maybe stereotypically black names or stereotypically Latino names or stereotypical white or Asian names. And then we're gonna see who people hire. And invariably what they find is that people do what? They hire people who are most like them, right? Why? Because they probably feel more comfortable with them and they're not even recognizing that they're doing it. But what there, there's been other studies that have taken this to the next level where they actually track the eye movements. And what they found was this, that basically when people would be reviewing the, the resumes or CVs, that they would spend more time looking, if it was a, a, a person of a different race than them, they would spend more time looking at bad information for people who were different than them and more time looking at the good information for people who are more similar to them. So what they concluded was that our implicit attitude would seem to be directing our unconscious eye movements to provide exactly the information it wants for a rational decision. This is both extraordinary and very worrying. By the way, in scientific papers, seeing words extraordinary and very worrying are typically not things that you see as a regular, a regular type of writing, right? Which de just demonstrates the, the severity of that. So that also then has to speak to when we say like, oh, I don't think they'd be a good candidate here, or they're not a good fit. You have to ask yourself, why do we use that word fit? What was it about that? What was it about them that made, what was it about them that made us feel like they wouldn't be a good fit? And of course, we see it in education. We see it early on um, where th this is a study that was conducted by Gilliam. Um, this is a, a study out of Yale where basically uh, what they did was they gave uh, teachers video clips of children in preschool. And what they told them is, OK, so we're going to be looking at disciplinary issues. And the important thing about disciplinary issues is to detect them before they arise. And so what we're going to do is you're going to be presented with video clips of children who are beginning to engage in bad behavior. And what we need you to do is to identify those children. So the trick was it was a deception study. Deception meaning you don't really know the full, the full study that's taking place. And the reality was none of the clips had children behaving badly. It was a trick. But what they did was they, again, they tracked eye movements, and what did they find? They found that the teachers spent more time looking at certain students and less time looking for bad behaviors than others, and they found that the common tie between those students that they spent time looking at were, were that they were African American. Again, probably really good people with great intentions, not even realizing what they're doing. Does it make them bad? No. So one of the things that I like to say is being biased doesn't make you bad, it makes you human. Doing nothing about it is what's bad, because all of us have it. But if we choose to do nothing about it, then that's what, what continues to reify the challenges that we see. So I'm just going to close briefly um, with just some examples of microaggressions that are manifested by these, these types of biases. So for those of you who may not be aware, microaggressions are those very subtle ways that we, that we communicate to one another, uh, that we insult one another, and that we invalidate one another. They're pervasive and they're normal. Normal not meaning normal as in good or bad, just normal. It's part of our daily life and our daily experience. 
their put downs, their subtle snubs, their dismissive looks. And the research shows that they can actually be more psychologically damaging than direct forms of racism. I grew up in the, in the sticks. People called me an N-word every day to my face. If somebody called me the N-word, I knew that was the person I was not inviting to the birthday party, right? I knew where I stood. I knew what to do that. Someone calls you in, you know what box to put. That's the racism box. Okay, I know what, the, I know what that is. But with microaggressions, people don't necessarily realize what's taking place. So they start to then rationalize, is it me? What did I do? Is it, is it, what is it about me that makes people treat me this way? And because you don't necessarily know where to place it or what to do with it, it actually, the research has shown, shown that it tends to be more psychologically damaging. So this is what happens when people are microaggressed. It elevates their anxiety, fosters paranoia, lowers their self-esteem, limits their self-confidence, basically a bunch of bad things, right? That's in general society. We have to make sure that our students don't have those kind of experiences because it invalidates them. Here are the messages that are, are conveyed. Now here's the thing about microaggression. I say, a, say something to students. Here, the most common example of a microaggression is, wow, Luke, you're so articulate, right? But not just said as a compliment, but like with a sense of surprise, like someone didn't expect you to be. Like, oh, when, the, you know, when I saw them standing there, when they opened their mouth, I didn't expect them to talk like that, okay? Now, the message that is rendered is, wow, you're so articulate, right? But the message that is conveyed is what? I didn't expect you to be. So the thing is with microaggressions, it's not just about what is said or not said, it's about the, the meanings that are taken away from that. And here's what those meanings are. You're different from us, you don't belong here, you're not intelligent or capable, people of color are lazy, they don't care, your experiences and perceptions are wrong, you're criminal, you're dangerous, you're not of worth. These are the meanings that are, that are taken away from it. And there's different types of microaggressions. Um, they generally fall into two categories where you're essentially you're either insulting someone or you're invalidating their experience. The most common example, again, when we're talking about our students in general, is an ascription of intelligence, where we assign a degree of intelligence to them uh, based upon their, them being uh, people of color. You say to a person, wow, you're so articulate, but not, but not realizing that you're saying it from a sense of surprise. Sometimes I like to say back, back to people when they say that to me, wow, so are you. Because then it has them think this second, like, why did I say that to him, right? Um, here's one from early childhood education. Elsa is really smart. Actually, I'll have to tell you a real one, a real example. Sat down uh, with the, my daughter's teacher, and she had basically scored her in her, she had come out of one grade into the next and scored her lower than she had been the previous year. And we're trying to figure out, okay, why is that? So we asked the teacher, well, we'd like for you to reevaluate her because that's not where she was last year. So teacher reevaluates her, we go, we sit down with the teacher, and the teacher says to me and my wife, you know, your daughter, she's actually really smart, right? And she thought she was complimenting us. But me and my wife, my wife in particular does a lot of work on microaggressions, I thought she was going to fight this teacher. <laughs> I'm lit literally, her leg beneath the table was going like this, and I'm like this, I put my hand and like stop shaking her leg, and she goes, one of these, right? And it was like, it was all bad. <laughs> um, so we had to talk with her, that teacher about, you know, so why did you say that? What was it about our daughter that made you say that? Um, there have been times when I've answered a question and I get responses like, wow, I didn't expect you to know that. Uh, student, first day of class, they're looking for their class, trying to find the, the, the room, and a well-meaning educator says, oh, this is a calculus class, are you sure you're in the right place, right? Because they didn't expect them to be in that class. We hear this actually a lot from our students of color. Well-meaning educator, it's first day of class, I'm just trying to help people get to the room, but what was it about that student that made you ask them if they were in the right place? So we find this also comes from other students. Well, in particular with the work on men of color, we find that they are the last to be picked, or in many cases, they are not picked at all. Um, criminality, we know that um, our men of color and our students of color in general are soon to be dangerous, deviant, up to no good. An example of this in preschool, a 16-month-year-old Mexican-American child being given strikes or written up at the nursery for jumping. FYI, that's developmentally appropriate for a 16-month-year-old to be doing that, just saying. Um, following students of color around the campus bookstore to make sure they don't steal anything. 
checking a student's ID at nighttime because it's assumed they must be on campus to steal something, a teacher's taking a step backwards because of male colors in their class, pathologizing culture, saying about students, those students don't care about education, they're lazy, they aren't really here to learn, or they're just here for the financial aid. Um, the, this is a quote from a student, a Latino student, who says, the view of Latinos is we don't care about school, right? So it's just that stereotype of us. Another student said, there's a stigma that students of color don't want to learn. I've been in classes where professors think we don't want to learn. Another student said, when I go to class, I feel pressure to have to prove myself to the professor that I want to learn instead of a professor having an open mind that I want to learn. Here's another example of what we call different norming. That's where we uh, extol a student by essentially separating them from their group. So we say something negative about their group, but then we separate them. So assuming or having the authority to negatively characterize a student. When I was talking about those blacks, I wasn't talking about you. I don't think of you as Asian. I just think of you as one of us. You're not like the rest of them. You're different. Uh, you're different. You work hard. Why can't all minorities be like, be like you? You're a credit to your race. I've actually had someone say that to me. I was like, oh, wow. <laughs> and they really thought they were complimenting me. Yeah. I said, oh, so, um, forget, I'm going to stop. <laughs> I can get myself in trouble sometimes. All right, last two slides. Um, athletics. It is not uncommon for us, because remember I talked about what are some of those early images. Oftentimes, athletics comes up. Guess what? That's a very common area of microaggression. So you see a student, I've had uh, educators who attended trainings, and the training emphasized build relationships with students, which we have to do. But if we don't build relationships with students and also be aware of our unconscious biases, it can actually create more problems than good. So examples would be an educator walking up to a student. These are real examples. You look like a ball player. What sport do you play? <laughs> right? It was a, an educator who was trying to strike up a conversation with someone who they didn't know, but it kind of fell flat. Uh, when is the next game? How's the season going? Uh, here's one. The teacher didn't think I was performing well, so she said, I'm going to talk to your coach. I said, go ahead, because I thought she was foolish for assuming that I was an athlete. <laughs> By the way, the student wasn't an athlete. I wonder what happened when she talked to the coach. <laughs> so which one was it? <laughs> um, most of our students of color here are athletes, so they aren't doing well either. By the way, that's a general stereotype that typically is not true. Uh, Data tend to show that actually student athletes outperform um, our non-student non athletes, where there's a, typically an assumption that they underperform them, which is usually erroneous. And in fact, in my state, a student athlete is four and a half times more likely to transfer and two and a half times more likely to complete a certificate or a degree, which is not something that we would usually hear. Um, and but it goes to it. I'll tell you one other one, then I'll go to conclusion because we got to get out of here because I'm going over time. But one other one, I just got to tell you this one, it's really interesting. So Frank and I, we do a lot of speeches, we go to a lot of different places. Um, I've lost a little bit of weight recently, but um, let's just say that last year I was about 40 pounds more than I am right now, right? So glad I lost the weight. But so I was, and even then I'm still, I got a lot more to go. Now Frank, Frank is fit, right? You know, brother works out. So we um, oftentimes will go places and there will be like a cab or a taxi or an Uber that we'll take. And I can't tell you how many times like we get it and they, they turn to us and they say, oh, so what sport do you play? Now, if you saw Frank, you might think, okay, well, possibly he could be an athlete. But if you looked at me, like it would have to be the sorriest team ever, <laughs> right? <laughs> but it just goes to this assumption. Uh, another example is like at, at San Diego State, my home institution, we have our faculty staff club, right, where we go and we sit down and we eat together as faculty and staff and rub elbows and all that. And they have all these pictures on the wall across and around the faculty and staff club. There, in the club, there are only two pictures of African Americans. The rest of are pictures of students who are studying, student leaders, founding of the campus. What do you want to guess the two pictures are of the two African American students? Student athletes, right? Further reinforcing this concept. So what do we do? One, we have to acknowledge that racism with a little r, we're not talking about the big r here, we're talking about the unconscious part of this. It's a real problem because it influences the things that we do and say to our students that we don't even recognize that we're doing. Second, we have to gain a greater sense of ourselves. What do we think? So that's why I recommend it again, go take that 
implicit association test. I'm telling you, if if like this this day, my at least my portion of in, in contributing to this day will have been a success if everyone goes and takes that. All right? It's that important. Engage in cross-racial interaction. You have to engage with other people to help deconstruct and get rid of some of these stereotypes. Now, here's the thing. Having a room full of diverse students is not what I mean by cross-racial interaction because there is a power imbalance. I mean with people who you see as being equivalent to you. Now, you might say to yourself, hey, I come from a Freerian perspective. We're all equal. I'm equal with my students. Yes, I get that. But what I'm talking about is tr engaging with your colleagues who look different from you. You will oftentimes help, it'll help to deconstruct some of those perceptions. Learn about microaggressions. I only covered a few of the multiple different types of microaggressions. Be increasingly reflective. If you are engaging with a student and you notice that something goes off about their body language with you and you don't know really where to place it, well, one, being a, first of all, being aware that there was something off about their body language is already their first step. But then two, thinking about, why was that? Conveying high expectations and authentic care. So ultimately, everyone in here has microaggressed someone and will microaggress someone in the future. Okay, that's just a fact. So the thing that you could do that will better help to reduce instances of it is to counteract it by, by intentionally conveying high expectations for your students and demonstrating authentic care. When that happens, you will still have the harmful effect of a microaggression, but it won't be as harmful as it would have been if that person knows that you come from a good, but you are like, you care about them, that, that you are someone who's in their corner. Now, again, we have to reduce overall instances of microaggressions, but that's a practice that helps. And lastly, we have to take ownership for our mistakes. I have done microaggressions trainings I've do, done a lot of them. I've probably done, in the last year, 50. At two of those 50, I accidentally microaggressed someone in the middle of doing a training on microaggressions. <laughs> Talk about like being embarrassed, right? I, like, I, don't know, I don't know what I was thinking. I like, turned to somebody and I said something. I'm like, why did I say that? And then, of course, it's a microaggression training, so people feel like super emboldened. So they're like, that was a microaggression. I'm like, and I what do you do? You know what? You're right. It was. Please allow me to restate what I said in the way that I would have liked to have said it. Taking ownership is good because it makes people feel like, you know what, they're not crazy. Something like that did occur. And we worry about it like, oh, are they going to file a complaint against me? Or are they going to say this or say that? You know what? Take ownership, demonstrate authentic care, convey high expectations, and people will, will receive that. So we basically have a... Um, an, I didn't go into it today, but we have our, what we call six domains of institutional equity. And it's essentially this, the, the areas that if we're moving forward in equity agenda, we have to be thinking about each of these different areas. And so what I did is I listed some of the common challenges that we have in each of these areas. So the first area is policies, right? So those are the, the principles of action that are ratified by the institution that govern essentially what we do. Attitudes and dispositions the ways that we, the person thinks and feels, the politics and power dynamics, which are the relationships and interactions between units and actors, the structures, which we kind of talked about earlier, the ways in which the institution is designed and arranged, the culture, which is institutional norms, and then data practices. So just a, a few things that, that tend to inhibit equity initiatives from moving forward. So, uh, in, as context, in the state of California, we've had over the past several years what are called equity plans. So every campus had to do a plan where they identified students, groups, who experienced disproportionate impact, and almost all of them identified the kind of groups we were talking about today. Then they had to create a plan to intervene, and then what was really cool is the state gave them lots of money to do it. Um, but. Um, even in going to places where they've had plans where they haven't necessarily been resourced, we find that a lot of these issues tend to be the same. So here's the first one. So barriers to equity efforts in terms of policies. Here's, one, here's, a, here's a set of them. We don't offer professional development for classified staff. It's not uncommon for us to see places where staff aren't really part of the professional development structure. Um, sometimes that's simply because of function, like, hey, if we we can't close the office, right? So we have to have people here doing what they're doing. 
Um, Part-time faculty are not required to attend faculty meetings or office hours because they're not compensated for them. Students are not allowed to see a counselor without making an appointment in advance. Or our full-time faculty do not want to teach basic skills of developmental classes. Some of this resonating with the things from earlier. So these are some kind of issues in the, air, in the realm of policy that tend to, imp, that tend to impede our equity efforts. Attitudes and dispositions. Uh, students aren't prepared, serious or committed, right, that having that perspective. Um, English, or pick any department, refuses to participate in the equity discussion. They feel that equity means lowering standards by making it easier for students to pass classes. A common misnomer that's not true. Um, I'm not sure what you, expect me to, what you expect me to do with these students. These students have too much drama in their lives. I'm a faculty member, not a social worker. Uh, and of course, censoring dialogue around equity. So these are some of the kind of things that we see percolate that people will say because they feel like, oh, I don't know if I'm really on board with this equity initiative. Further, uh, looking at kind of stereotypes, like most students of color aren't serious about their education. They're only here for sports or financial aid. We tried to hire a minority faculty member, but we couldn't find one who was qualified. Not one? <laughs> All right. Uh, poor conceptualization of equity or conflating equity with equality. Um, yeah, you know, campuses are like, oh, yeah, we're all about equity, but they don't really have an understanding what that means. So everyone should receive the same thing, which is not equity. Uh, why are we only focusing on men of color or insert any other population? Uh, they're such a small part of our population. Politics and power dynamics. Territorialism between instruction and student services. Why is student services leading this initiative? Shouldn't it be led by academic affairs? Or why is academic affairs leading this initiative? Shouldn't it be led by student, uh, student affairs, student services? Or even across departments. Uh, we've seen places where they've created early alert systems, but it was created by the math department. And so then because the math department did it, none of the other departments wanted to do it because math created it. All right, lack of effective partnerships between instruction classified student services. Uh, this would be an amazing program for students, but it would require significant collaboration between academic affairs and, stu and student services. I just don't think we can do that right now. Structures, right? Um, equity is not embedded into the strategic plan we talked about that earlier. Turnovers and leadership uh, are very common. Our previous dean was really effective in advancing equity agenda, but he left to take a position at another campus. Built environment, our part time faculty don't have offices. These are all structural components. More structure. Um, all of the equity work takes place in EOP, Emoja, pick a program. Like, um, so you'll have a greater conversation about equity, and, and someone will pick what we call like a categorical program that's designed to serve a specific population. Say, so, well, don't they do that? So the challenge is if, for example, a program, an average program for men of color serves. I don't know, 30, 30 guys at most. So if we're talking about you know, the opportunity for those 30 guys, that's great. But if we're talking about changing the campus environment, 30 isn't going to reach that when you're talking about thousands, right? 30 is important for those 30 guys. And it's also important for the campus to send a message, but it doesn't help to address the wider issue totally, by itself at least. Resource constraints. We'd really like to do that, but we don't have money, space, or people to do it. We only offer this support uh, while we have the funding in place. Uh, one, we have limited student parking. If they want to park on campus, they need to arrive by 8 a.m. So structural concerns that prevent students from getting the class. This is also a concern for faculty too. I don't know about you, but I have a problem getting my class at the time. Too activity focused. We're doing too many different things that are loosely connected to equity. So 10,000 things will never be as impactful as you know 10 really well crafted activities. Overcommitment to the status quo. So we saw this, this is not a perfect example of this, but um, we would see in California, for example, campuses would get money and they would use it to basically build a STEM center. But there was no students of color in STEM, right? But the argument, well, well we, need, we always need to do that. And well, maybe it'll help us attract students. But you know, so sometimes funding really was really in place. Data practices, institutional researcher is not collaborative or sees himself or herself as a gatekeeper. In fact, oftentimes with the work we do, the, one of the most important determinants of whether or not we can be successful is whether the institutional research staff is on board. They 
hold a lot of power, which is good. And they oftentimes wield it very carefully, which is you know important. But if you find someone who truly believes that equity is something that is wrong, and they're in institutional research, it can be very difficult to move forward an agenda. Uh, no inquiries to inform planning. So that's where we go out and we say, oh, well, hey, this is the best practice that we saw somewhere else. Let's just do it without doing some sort of inquiry to determine whether it's useful here. Not disaggregating outcomes and over-reliance upon uh, quantitative data sources. Frank put that one in as a dig to me because I do quant, <laughs> Frank does qual, if you've ever seen this present. So I don't know, I just thought those, those would be interesting just to see some of the things that we see as kind of some common pitfalls. So I gave you a lot of stuff today. Hopefully that was worth, well worthwhile. Thank you for your time and for your attention.